you ready to start? So I just want to start with um, opening up with prayer before we begin. Thank you, Father, for having this opportunity to come into your presence. Thank you for discussing your word and your truth. Father, I just ask that you speak to our hearts through your spirit. You reveal your word to us that's relevant for our time and the time, uh, current place we're in. And I thank you, Father, for your wonderful truth and your gracious spirit for revealing it to us. I thank you in the mighty name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to start with um, week 48. And the name of this Torah portion is Shoftim. That means just judges. So we're going to read, uh, we're going to study uh, the passage from Deuteronomy chapter 16 to Deuteronomy chapter 21. So the Torah portion for those who are new um, is basically going through the first five books of the Bible as a structure. And we refer to the prophets and the New Testament um, to fill in the gaps and to build the bridge in between the Old and the New Testament. What I also like to do is, uh, when I do the studies, how it is relating to us living in the end times. Because I believe we are the last generation, and there's a lot of things prophetically that's relevant to us that we need to understand. Specifically, things regarding leadership, things regarding the enemy, and things regarding the body of Messiah, and what we need to know and do as the bride to prepare for his coming. Now, as we know, when we discuss the Feast of Shavuot, it's all about the harvest at the end of the day. Now, if you think about it, what does it mean if there's a harvest? It means that there is a lot of people going to come into the kingdom, and that we are currently studying and learning for their benefit. We need to be equipped equipped in order to help those when they come in to disciple them. So it's not about your salvation, your knowledge, and that you now know uh, interesting things. It's about the next generation, the next people coming in to the kingdom during these times called the harvest. Now last week we look at specifically the time period of um, the threshing floor. We also looked at the time period called the wine press. And those two symbols relate to two different harvests. Now there are three pilgrim festivals. The first one has to do with unleavened bread. And it connects through first fruits to Shavuot. Now Shavuot is the feast of the wheat harvest. That is where the seed will be crushed. Uh, The wheat will be crushed and the seed will be gathered into the barn. And the chaff will move over into the time of the wine press. And that's the verse we looked at last week. Now the wine press is another separation uh, time period where the grapes will be uh, uh, squashed in order to produce the juice that will produce the wine for the wedding feast that comes after the wine press period. Now the separation that will take place at the end of the wine press is the separation between the wine and they are typically the guests and the, the, the grape skins, and they are basically symbolizing the, the tares, the wheat, and those who are separated, those who rebelled, even through the time of the second harvest. Now, I meditated a bit on time. What does time mean? Now, if you think about time, time doesn't mean anything unless you connect it to an event. So if you say, I've got a hair appointment, and you just leave it open, Okay, good on you. You've got a hair appointment. If you don't know which time the hair hair appointment is, it doesn't mean anything. If you say, I'm going to do something at 3 o'clock next week, Tuesday, it doesn't mean anything unless you reveal what you're going to do 3 o'clock next week, Tuesday. Now, In the same way, prophecy doesn't mean anything unless you connect it to time. And Yahweh revealed prophecy to us to reveal it to us in a specific time. Now, the word for time is the word yom. And yom can mean a 12-hour daylight period. It can mean a 24-hour day. It can mean a lifetime. It can mean a week. It's just a defined time period. 
And where the yom gets its context or the essence of how long it is, is within the context of where it is used. So when we spoke about last week, the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh, that is the yom of Yahweh, that is a time period. And we looked at the two time periods or the two days or the two yoms. The one was the Great Tribulation, the other one was the wine press. The one is three and a half years long, that's a defined timeline. The other one's a thousand years long. And both are connected to the word Yom. Now there are two festivals that are depicted or that earmarked by the title Yom. And the first one is Yom Teruah, and the second one is Yom Kippur. Now those two Yoms connect to these two harvests. Now Yom Teruah is basically in sync with the time period of the Great Tribulation. Now on the chart, I've drawn it in here between those two narrow uh, lines in comparison to the thousand year time period. So that's Yom 1, which is typically associated with the Great Tribulation and the wheat harvest. And the second Yom is the thousand year wine press. And that has to do with the fruit harvest. So those two times are both referring to the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh. Now there's a day of Yahweh which is referring to this period and a day of Yahweh that refers to that one and a day of Yahweh that refers to the total period. Now every Yom or every time period is a time of separation where he will separate the people based on what that theme is. And there's going to be uh, tribulation or um, difficulties coming and that will stimulate the separation process. So each one of them are not a pleasant time because it's a time of separation. So if you think for yourself, if you are in a habit and you are comfortable of doing the same thing all the time, that was the case with me. I was into my little way of doing things, my cycle, everything was sorted out. And then my whole life changed when I I got a new job. Now I have to restructure everything because... Everything is now upset. So it was very uncomfortable for me to change my habits around the things that I normally do. And that is what these times represent. It's changing and forcing people to change their habits, to be forced to come out of their comfort zones. So we're going to look at these time frames, but in relation to the judges, which is shoftim, um, which is the plural of judge, And the singular of judge is Shafat. And we're going to look at those time periods associated with the judges. Now the judges um, is basically uh, meaning to govern or to rule. That's the word Shafat. And Shafat is first found in scripture where in Genesis 16 verse 5 where Sarai told Abraham that Yahweh had to be the judge between her and Hagar, since Hagar carried the child and she despised Sarah for being barren. And then she uh, pleaded to Yahweh to be the judge between her and Hagar. Now what we note here is how Sarah and Abraham's names are written. It is prior to their names being changed. Now we spoke about this previously, that Sarah, uh, Sarah changed to Sarai, And Abraham changed to Abraham. Both received the letter He. Now for those who are not familiar with the Hebrew, the letter He looks like this. And it's got a little window there. So that means it let light in. So letter He means light and also means revelation. And it also means the Holy Spirit because it's the sound of breath, which is ruach. So it's the spirit that reveal the truth or the light when you receive that letter into your name. Now, the situation evolved in the time where Sarah and Abraham did not have the enlightenment of Yahweh's spirit. And that caused them to make a decision that was fleshly, and the end result of the decision was a child from the flesh which was Ishmael that came through Hagar, which was Abraham's son. And that caused a lot of issues. 
So we can see the purpose of a judge is to deal with situations that occurred as a result of people acting in the flesh or acting without the guidance of Yahweh's spirit or in the absence of Yahweh's truth. And that's why judges are needed. Now if we look at the word shafat, it's a shen pei tet. Now this is singular for shoftim. And you can see the letter shin there. Now the letter shin means fire. It also means Holy Spirit and anointing. So this implies that a judge is someone who is anointed by Yahweh's Spirit. But there's a relationship between the shin and the letter hay. If you think about it, if hay means light, and that's a fire, that's a source of light, so the shin is actually causing the hay. And the hay is a consequence of the shin. So the shin is actually what the actual spirit of Yahweh is represented by. And the shin is also energy. That is through which Yahweh created. And that's where, how he separated the waters from the waters. The water is mayim. And the heavens is shamahim. So shamahim. Sham, Shem, Mayim, and Mayim is basically that, and that is the Shin that separated the Shamahim from the Mayim. So it's the energy or the essence of Yahweh and his creative power, and that's also the power that resurrected Yeshua from the grave. And that same power is the anointing that is upon the judges, that... Uh, and that flame and the fire is automatically linked to the burning bush, to Mount Sinai stop where the fire came down. It's also linked to the fire, tongues of fire coming down on the people in the upper room on the day of Pentecost or Shavuot. So it depicts the actual power of the spirit of Yahweh that causes revelation. So you basically have both if you have the shin or the anointing of Yahweh. And that is also what it means to be baptized by fire, is to have that core essence of his power, of his spirit within you, that kind of anointing. Not just a personal um, relationship with Yahweh, where he revealed truth to you. It's an anointing where you can actually fulfill a function within the body of Messiah. So it's not personal, it's to do a task within the kingdom. And that is basically what a judge is. So a judge is appointed from amongst the people to fulfill a task within the body or within, the case, in this case, Israel. Now we see the word, um, the passage in Deuteronomy 16 verse 18 and 20 give us insight into these leaders. And it says, appoint judges and officers for each of your tribes in every town Yahweh your Elohim is giving you and they shall judge the people fairly follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land Yahweh your Elohim is giving you so we see the first of all what jumped out at me is the fact that the consequence of having justice amongst the people is so that they may live that is the reason why Yahweh gave judges, so that people can survive and not destroy themselves through sin. The other thing that, uh, that um, I saw was he mentioned two kinds of leadership here. The first one is judges, which is Shoftim, and the other one is officers or uh, uh, overseer. And that's the word Shapat. Now, it's wrong in your notes, so I fixed it. Uh, for those who want to download the PDF. So it is the word um, Shabbat and, ah, sorry, Shoter. I think I put there Shorter or something. Shoter, um, which is overseer, and Shabbat is a singular for judge. So those are the two words that Yahweh defines his leadership that is required to govern his people for justice to exist with, in their midst so that they can live. So we're going to look at these two words and what it means. So the first word, Shabbat, starts with the letter Shin that I already described, similar to Shoter. And you can see both share the same letter, Tet. 
one in the middle, one at the end. So the, the judge, um, Shapat, has got a pay, and Shoter, which is an overseer, has got a resh that make them different to one another. So what is the meaning of a resh? It means leader, and that leader is on the left. So it's leadership that lead people in the physical. The Shapat has got the letter pay in the middle, and letter pay means mouth or to speak. So they are the ones who speak, and these are the ones who lead. And the overseer is also known as a scribe, because one of the meanings of shoter means to write. And the written word is basically what we know in Greek as logos. The shapat, the word that is spoken, is what we know in Greek as rhema. So those are the two components of what the leadership consists of that is required for the people to live. Now the overseer lay the foundation of the written word so that the judge can rule from that foundation and speak the words over the people, ruling them or speaking judgment. So this shoter is a higher level than a shapat. And the overseer is similar to Yeshua being the head, which is also the letter resh, it also means head. He is the head of the body, the shoter, the overseer of the people or the leaders who lead the people, the anointed ones, which are basically shapat or shoftim, who are judges. So if you receive a gift of the spirit, that anointing equip you to become a mouthpiece or a judge to speak righteousness and judge justice within the congregation regarding your gift. And both are required for the body of Messiah to exist. Now if you draw this example back to the time of Moses and Aaron, so who was the Shapat and who was the Shoter? Basically, um, Moses was the shorter one. <laughs> Shoter, because he received the written word. And everything he received was written down. And we know that Moses didn't have the ability to speak. That's why Aaron, um, his brother, Yahweh allowed him to be the shapat or fulfill the role of the judge. So Moses was the leader, a higher type of leader than Aaron. And together they fulfilled this function. So in a sense, Moses carried... Um, a prophetic picture of what Messiah is like. That's why it says in the New Testament, Yeshua is a prophet like Moses. Because he was a shoter, he was one that depicts the written word or the Torah, and Yeshua is also the living Torah or the living word. And that is how these things interlink. So as I said previously, the one it worked with us, we are the judges, he is our overseer, he is the head, we are the body, and together we rule collectively with everybody, part of this uh, body representing the fullness of the Messiah within the assembly. So, bringing it down to our current situation, where we live, and I believe we live in the last generation. So we are currently in the time called the Age of the Gentiles, which is a 2,000 year period, and it's a time period in between the two comings of Messiah. It's between his first coming and his second coming. So I've got, I got his first coming depicted on the timeline there, and his second coming depicted there. So the first coming, he came as the messenger and the servant. He came to correct his word, to set the standard. And after that, his second coming, he will be the judge. And then after the thousand years, he will come again, and then he will establish the kingdom as the king. So those three attributes is what we know as Elohim. And that is why Yeshua is Elohim or God in the flesh, because of those three functions he fulfilled in the physical realm. All right, so judges... The book of Judges is giving us a bit more detail about 
this topic within this Torah portion. And the book of Judges consists of a, a collection of 12 judges that ruled the people during the time period from Joshua up to King Saul and up to King David. So it's in a time period before there was a king. And having a king was not the model that Yahweh actually presented to the people. Having a king is based on what the pagan nations had. And Israel was longing for a king. And we're going to look at the first king in a moment, which was King Saul, and what he represents. But before I do that, I just want to lay the foundation of the time of the judges. So the time of the judges in our time period in between the first and second coming of Messiah, that is basically the time of um, the Shoftim, the time of the judges. Because the verse in Judges 21 verse 25 gives us the insight that this is the case. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did the right in his own eyes. So everybody think that he is right, and he's doing right according to his own belief. And that is so true today um, within the body of Messiah. Uh, people don't believe that anybody can teach them because there's a scripture that, that tell them that, that they take out of context without a second witness, and they believe they can, they, they represent the fullness of Messiah on their own, but they meet, miss a lot of other scripture that confirm that. So they have a disjointed idea of how Yahweh's leadership is supposed to be set up during this time. And then they think whatever they know is right, they do that. But it differs from other people, and that's causing chaos. And that's why there are over 40,000 different Christian denominations today, because of that verse. So what Yahweh is doing, he's helping us because we're going to go through a similar cycle, and we are going through a similar cycle as what I depicted here, it's got six steps. Now the first step is the ideal. That is where we serve Yahweh. But that doesn't last too long because of the influence of the nations that we live amongst. And then we start to, to, to get involved into sin and we scale down our standards and we want to be friends with the nations and we want to uh, rather love everybody than to be different. So we compromise, and at the end we allow sin, and then we start to rebel, and at the end we serve their idols. And that will bring the next step, if you fall into that trap, which is to be enslaved by the enemy, which is a curse. Now if we look at our nation today and the things we face, one of the main topics today we hear about in the news is about marriage. Um, and the sacredity of marriage. So what are we doing as a nation? We serve Yahweh, but there's a minority group who start to influence the masses, and they will start to rebel against Yahweh's word regarding marriage. And now we're going to compromise because we want to love everybody and accommodate everybody. And then we sooner or later going to worship the same idol. And that idol is the standard that the worldly system set. And we're going to bow down to that standard to accept that. And once that happens as a nation, our nation will fall into step three, which is to be cursed and be enslaved by an enemy. So that is why you can't be neutral about this. If you just blase or nothing to do with me, if two men want to love one another, they can do whatever they want. The problem is that they live in the same nation that you do. And the curse that is invoked by the actions of those people collectively will cause the whole nation to slip into this state. So we can't just sit there and accept it and not do anything about it or not pray about it. And that is what we are currently slipping into, I think, as a nation. So what will happen once we get enslaved and oppressed? The people will suffer and they will start to cry out to Yahweh. Now, step number four is basically what we see here. That's a step number four. That's also step number four. And this is step number two and a number three. 
So some people, or maybe even a one. So some people serve Yahweh. A lot of people start to compromise and allow sin in their lives. Now I'm talking about the body of Messiah here. Yeah? And as soon as we become like the nations, we will start to be enslaved and cursed by the enemy. Oh, sorry, that's a number three. And a number four is over there. And the enemy will oppress us. And then we'll start to cry out to Yahweh. So we have no choice. And we can see that slipping in that direction is actually slipping in that direction as well. Because this is the time frame of that happening. And this number three is called the Great Tribulation. That's what it starts off with. And that's the reason why there is a Great Tribulation. Because the nation is allowing that to come over them. Now we're going to be in the tribulation and we're going to cry out and there's going to be a lot of people with us in the tribulation and they're going to cry out with us. So where's the logic of the bride being raptured during this time? I don't see anything here. I don't see an arrow going from here directly back to number one, which is the rapture. I just serve Yahweh, play my harp on my cloud. And all the other who, start, who decide to sin, they, they, they're down there. That's not the way it works. The bride's got a function, and we're going to look at Gideon. He depict the judge that's going to exist, or the type of leader that need to exist during that time. And he's got a role to play for the benefit of the people who are enslaved and who are crying out. Without the judge... They will not live. They will not be justice for them. As we read in that first verse. So it's Yahweh's grace to allow a judge. And who is that judge? It is his righteous people. Who still follow his ways. And we're going to look at Gideon and what his task was. During that time to help the people. That are in that time. So this time is not something that you can escape. It's something we're going to go into. And it's going to be triggered just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Judgment was triggered by the sin that cried out to Yahweh. And he himself came down to have a look what's going on. And then he had a good discussion with his friend Abraham about the situation. Abraham pleaded, but there was not enough people who were righteous to save the nation. And the majority, I say 90% of the nation, died. Maybe 99%. You only take Lot and his family in relation to the rest of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we are currently in that situation, but luckily Yahweh is not going to destroy everybody. That's what grace is for. And the other thing I want to just point out is the term grace. People use grace nowadays to hide behind when they sin. Oh, I can do that. There's grace. He doesn't care about that anymore because he's a forgiving father. Grace is not a shield or something you hide behind to hide your nakedness. It's not a fig leaf. Grace is something you need in the time of trouble. It's a lifeline being thrown out, cast out to those who are in trouble, and he's going to pull them out by his grace. So this time period is where his grace will be poured out. During those times, specifically the first one. And the time of grace is to separate the people who cry out where the judge is sent and they will repent. And if they repent, then they will serve Yahweh, enter into the kingdom. And those who do not repent and do not listen to the judge and do not cry out, they will stay being enslaved. And they will go to the next phase. And at the end, they will be separated to a lower state, which is called death. And death in Hebrew means separation, to be separated from Yahweh completely. So we don't want to end up into that phase. So the overseer, going back to the overseer, it's a military term. Um, a judge is also a military term. And it's also a legal role. So they have to have the word or the foundation that's written down in order to be a good judge. You cannot be a righteous judge 
without a law. Now, you can think for yourself in today's world, if you tell the judges the law is done away with, then the judge will throw his little wick out and say, I can't be a judge anymore. How can I judge if there's no foundation to stand on to show what is right and what is wrong? So we need the foundation of the word in order to be a good or righteous just, just judge. So looking at the timeline, um, we're going to look at the first uh, judge, which is Othniel. Othniel. And he depicts the first judge which associate with the Messiah. So we're going to look at his attributes. I'm actually jumping here. Let me quickly go back to the two kings. Sorry about that. Page three. The two kings. As I said, the time of the judges. After the judges, there were two kings. Uh, for the second righteous king to be crowned, which is David. There was a preceding king called Saul. Now what is interesting about the Hebrew, the name revealed the character as well as the destiny. And Saul's name means desired. And Saul comes from the root word sha'al, that means to beg, to consult or to seek. And that's exactly what the people did. They begged and they sought Yahweh to give them a king. They desired a king. And that is exactly what Saul, Saul's name means. But we know that Saul comes from the tribe of Benjamin. And in previous studies, we learned that the Benjamites also had people called the sons of Belial, or the lawless ones. And that gives us the flavor of Saul's background, or his foundation, that he operated from. Because he was the king that was dethroned or demoted by Yahweh, because of his rebellion not obeying the foundation of Yahweh's word. And he wanted to do things like Frank Sinatra, his own way. And we also see that um, from the root word Sha'al, that means to beg. That's a previous Torah portion where the similar word, which was Ve'et Hanan, that means I pleaded. So this king or leader, at the end, will plead just like in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, that says, Lord, Lord, we've done this, we've done that in your name. And you'll say, depart from me, I do not know you. And this first king is typically uh, revealing to us a lawless king who will beg at the end for mercy because he is an unjust king. Now, if we look at the prophetic picture of that in comparison to David, that was a righteous, beloved king. And we know that David depicted um, or depicts the Messiah. Then the preceding king will be the anti-Messiah or the lawless one, which is Apollyon, the man of perdition. Um, and that king is the one that will come first. Now these two kings will rule and that will be part of the separation process as well. Now if you think of any false teacher, false leader, or uh, anti-Messiah in this case, what, is they, what do they really represent? They uh, represent the masses. If you take a leader that is appointed by people, the majority of the people want someone like that to rule them. So if you look at the leader and their corruption, it reflects the corruption of the people that support that leader. So the separation process will take place where the anti-Messiah who will represent certain values will be followed by the masses who are just as corrupt as him. And those who follow him will be separated away from the ones who will see this is not a righteous king, I don't want anything to do with him. And that natural separation will take place. So having the anti-Messiah or an unjust leader in power is a test for the process that needs to take place to separate the sheep from the goats. If there's only a righteous king, you can't really have a good separation unless you have an unjust king first to do that first step of separation. So that is what the two kings represent, the anti-messiah and the real messiah. Both will come with white 
horses. But the first king will only ride on the horse, but he won't have a clothing dipped in blood. And his weapon is a bow without arrows, not a sword. So he has the appearance of the Messiah, but he's got the wrong clothing on and the wrong weapon. So what does the clothing represent? Your clothing is your righteousness or your actions. So he will have the wrong actions. The weapon that Yeshua has is a two-edged sword coming from his mouth. That's, a, that's symbolism of the word of Yahweh that is in his mouth that he's speaking and he's cutting or separating with his words because he's fulfilling the task of a judge, separating from the basis of the Logos or the written Torah. And the anti-Messiah's got a bow without arrows. Now an arrow or a bow and arrow is a weapon that depicts slander because it's a weapon you shoot from behind a place where no one can see that you're shooting from. And if the arrow hits you, you don't know who said it. And that's what slander is. So he's, he's got his bow with him with no arrows because he has already fired them. He has already s shot out his false messages and he's hitting his targets, which is normally leadership. And that put him in power and now he's ruling. He doesn't have to fire another shot because they are now worshipping him. And it will take that the, the real Messiah will come with the sword of his mouth to defeat his enemies at his second coming. But his second coming, he will be the judge, but he will not come physically to the earth. He will come to gather his bride and separate them. And the final event after the thousand years, that is where his feet will touch the Mount of Olives where the mountain will split open. So that's something we discussed last week, and where that final separation will take place that will be followed by the marriage festival, where the bride will um, marry the king. So that is basically what the two kings represent within this time frame. So the anti-Messiah is going to rule three and a half years the time period of the Great Tribulation. Now, as, we, as we've seen, number three is where you are enslaved by an enemy that is a curse. So the enemy that will enslave the nations is the anti-Messiah who will rule over the nations, enslaving them. And that is the curse that came upon the people. And then the people will cry out, Yahweh will send a judge, and then Gideon will rock up Say, so here I am, choose me. Now, um, we'll, we'll look at the detail about um, Gideon. He was not that courageous at first. So, those who will be in that time, if Yahweh is calling you, the, the story of Gideon is basically what will happen during that time that will give you more insight in what leadership need to be like during that time. So, the first judge we're going to look at is... I spell this correctly, yeah, Othniel. And he depicts the perfect judge, which is Yeshua. And that is found with all the symbolism. Now, Othniel means the force or lion of Elohim. And we know that symbolism of Yeshua as well. He's the lion of Judah. And he is the first one who is featured in chapter 1 of the book of Judges as well, where he conquered the city of the scroll. Now, the city of the scroll is connected to the scribe and the word that's written. So conquering the city of the scroll mean, meant I mean, that he overcame the challenges of understanding the word. He fully had a comprehension of what the word is about. He conquered that subject, if you like. And also within chapter 1, he said, it is said um, that he received the waters from above and the waters from below. So what does that entail? The waters from above, we know water. The symbolism of water means the word. And if the water comes from above, it means it's a spiritual revelation that comes directly from Yahweh, which is the Rema word that is spoken typically by prophets. That is the waters from above, so that is the gift of prophecy. And the waters from below is basically the foundation he's standing upon, which is the written word, the Torah. 
and also the practical way of interpreting what this word means within a certain situation so that they can be an effective judge. And that is the gifting that he received. Now that's exactly, if you think back of Yeshua's ministry, he was the one who conquered the scroll because he was the scroll. He is the one who came from above. He is the word that was sent from above. And he is the living Torah walking amongst the people. And he walked the Torah without sinning. He walked it out perfectly because he understood it intimately because that's his character. Then Othniel, it later revealed that he received a bride and he also received a field. Now we know that the bride is a symbolism of the bride of Messiah. That also confirms that Othniel represents the Messiah. And he also received the gift of a field or a promise of a field. Now the field is a symbolism of the nations where the people will be harvested from, and that's from that field. And that means that the people will come to faith during the time where he will be king or where he will rule. So when he come as a judge, that field will be harvested, and that is part of his inheritance. And the bride will also be part of his inheritance that he will receive during that time when he gather her at the end of that period. So we can see from uh, all this symbolism that Othniel represented Yeshua. Um, there's another interesting fact. Um, he uh, ruled for, uh, as, as because of his rule, there was peace for 40 years. The number 40 means the work of the Messiah, also similar to number 4, and that also confirmed that he is the Messiah. So that is the first judge, just laying the foundation. And that is basically lining up with the first coming of Messiah, giving us his ministry. Did I miss anything? No. The next judge is Ehud. Ehud. Now, Ehud was not the perfect judge. I would actually call him a bad judge that has potential. Because he was a bit you know, off in his ways. He was aspiring or probably a judge in training. He's not there yet. And that is found um, in Judges chapter 3. Now, Ehud had the attributes of being left-handed and, sorry, and he killed a king called Eglon, the king of Moab, through trickery. So, he didn't have a straight strategic plan that came from Yahweh. So he made up his own little plan in order to kill the king. And it also revealed that he had a knife. He made himself a knife. Now we know that the sword is a symbol of the word of Yahweh. So a knife is something like a sword but not really a sword. So it's your own interpretation of what the sword is supposed to be like but it falls short from the real thing. So it's a false doctrine or a more or less okay doctrine that's entangled with a lot of interpretation and ideas that's coming from man. So that is the knife in his left hand, and left means physical. So it was still one foot in the world, one foot following Yahweh, uh, having his own interpretation, and he went to the king. Now what's interesting about this king, he said it was a, a extremely overweight king, a fat king. And um, this king, the people wanted to present a gift to the king that they made. So it showed that the people actually worshipped the king or the, the king of the people that oppressed them. And they wanted this judge to offer up a gift unto this king. Now this judge represent a religious leader so if the people ask the religious leader to present a gift to the false god, it's actually an act of idolatry. But they thought they are worshipping Yahweh, and we get the knowledge from that, from the meaning of this king. The king's name was Eglon, and Eglon means to be calf-like. So it's like the golden calf, and the king had similar attributes as the golden calf that Israel worshipped. So Israel thought they worship Yahweh, but through the symbolism of Egypt, that made it idol worship. 
It doesn't make it right even if you are sincerely wrong. So the people worship Yahweh that was overweightly packed with all their traditions and symbolism from the idols of the nations that made him overweight in his symbolism. And they wanted to worship him, give him a gift. And they asked the religious leader to go and offer up a gift to him. Now I think down the line the religious leader thought that there must be something wrong with his setup, and Yahweh inspired him to kill the king. Now in the process, he killed the king with his left hand, with his short knife, and he lost his knife in the fat. <laughs> so that means that he lost his false doctrine. He probably came to his senses, and that caused the death of the king. So that's why I say that this judge or religious leader has potential, because eventually... They came to the truth, and that truth defeated the idol that oppressed them. And that Ehud, he is currently in our time frame. And that is what is referred to as false teachers and false prophets. So don't really um, be aggravated totally against them, because they believe. They just need a, 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 a enough oppression for them to open up their eyes and then see, and the little knife they had will be enough to kill the idol or the, the false god. And have you thought of what that small knife might represent? It's basically the only truth that's still from Scripture, and that is that Yeshua is the Messiah, and he is the one who died for our sin, and he is the one who overcame the enemy. That truth alone is enough to destroy the enemy, that short knife. But you're going to lose that knife in the end. <laughs> um, but you'll receive the full sword of his word at the end of the day. The full revelation of who Yahweh is and who Yeshua is after the smoke clears. Um, Ehud, this is the, the bad judge. His name means united and I will give thanks. Now, there's a lot of effort going into the Christian scene of bringing churches together, bringing believers together in unity. And that's basically what we see from Ehud's name. And the foundation of, or the premise of the unity is to give thanks unto Yahweh. And what's a better way of giving thanks than singing a song? That's why worship, praise and worship, is so prominent today. Because that is the way people are united how many people listen to Hillsong music or to whatever uh, mainstream uh, uh, Christian band? And that brings everybody together into unity. And that, in a sense, is a good thing. But as I said, it's a short knife. It's not the whole sort or not the whole truth. But it does fulfill a purpose. There is good in that. And eventually it will kill the enemy. So there's not all doom and gloom in that regard. Um, next judge, Deborah. Now Deborah is the judge that exists in the same time frame as Ehud. Now Deborah is a picture of a perfect judge, just like Othniel was a picture of a perfect judge. But this perfect judge is the Shoter, or the written word, which is Yeshua, the head. And Deborah is basically the shapat, or the judge, that is submitting under the authority of the head. But she's got the pay or the mouth. Because it's said that she is a, a prophetess. So she spoke the word of Yahweh that she received from above. Just like Othniel. And that made her an anointed judge. And that's one of the things that was accredited to her in this passage. He said that she was filled with the spirit of Yahweh. And Judges 4 verse 5 says, And she lived under a palm tree uh, of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment or for advice. Now, what's interesting is that she sat under a palm tree. 
Now, when I read Gideon, the angel sat under an oak tree. So it must be something to do with a tree. So the palm tree is the word tomer, that means post or column. Now, if you understand the symbolism of a post or a column, it's something that upholds the lintel, that opens up the door. And supporting the lintel is basically what the Hebrew word uh, for truth means, ach, and faith means. So the act of supporting is what faithfulness is. And that is what the palm tree represent that she sat under. So she had faith, just like the picture with Moses, Aaron, and her, when they battle against Amalek. Aaron and her held up his arms, so his staff can be uplifted. Deborah was the one who uplifted the arms of the people who gave them faith to stand up against the enemy. And that was her function as Aaron and her to uphold the faith and to teach people the truth so that they can believe and be faithful. Now, palm tree, Tomer, if you change the vowel points, it makes the word Tamar. That is the name of the mother who had two sons from Judah. And the first son's name was Zerah, and the other one was Perez. Now, Zerah means brightness, and Perez means divided. Now, these two brothers represent the first and second coming of Messiah Yeshua. Now, the Zerah, his hand was born first. So his hand came out, and it was very important for them to know who is born first. So they put a red string around his arm, and then he pulled back his arm. And then Perez was born, and then Zerah was born after him the string on his hand. So that depicts this first and second coming of Messiah because the first coming was for a short stint where Yeshua only brought his right hand and did the work of the sacrifice, which is the red string, and he pulled back his arm, so he went back to the Father. Then his act of doing that brought division amongst his brethren, which is Perez. And that division is until this day. And he will be born again, but this time in the fullness or the brightness of his coming, which is the, name, the meaning of the name Zerah. And we will see the fullness of him revealed, just like on the mountain of transfiguration, where the Messiah will be revealed. And then he will be revealed as the king and the Messiah. And that will be basically when he will come the third time with the new Jerusalem as the king. So this is uh, connected to Deborah. So Deborah is the one who's going to reveal the Messiah to the people who are divided. So who are divided? The two sticks, Ephraim and Judah. So she needs to convince Judah of who the Messiah is. And that is her current job during this time. And she's also convincing Ephraim that they are part of Israel. That's the other part of, of her role. And that is the function of Deborah during this time period that we find ourselves in. And that's also what these studies are about, is to be like Deborah, to speak to our Jewish brothers and to our Christian brothers so that the two sticks can come together as one. Now, Deborah... Um, which time scale does she represent? Can we get confirmation on that? That is seen in the symbolism found in the verse um, that describe her. And the symbolism is found within the words Rama, Bethel, and Ephraim. Now, Rama means elevated and raised up to a place. And the elevation we looked at last week is where the bride will be gathered. That's the elevation. And that's what Deborah also depicts, is the bride, because she's got balanced truth. Like in Revelation, it says that she's got the witness of Yeshua the Messiah, and she do the commandments. She adhered to the word and the, the fullness of the truth of his full uh, scripture. So that is the elevation part or the gathering that will take place when the first separation happened during the time of the second coming. Bethel means house of Elohim. So she will be gathered and taken to the house of Elohim, which is in the kingdom. But during that time, she will also 
rule the nations or judge the nations. So Deborah is found during our current time. She will be gathered or elevated, but then she will rule the nations during the thousand years. And that is what we discussed last week. There was 20 years of oppression prior to uh, rule, and that 20 is also similar in Hebrew to 2000, and that is the age of the Gentiles, the 2000 years between the first and second coming of Messiah, and that confirms a current time frame. So you can decide, because we've got a choice, whether we want to follow Ehud, which is the left-handed man with his own little pocket knife, probably a Swiss army knife, and he's currently carrying a gift to the fat king. And the king is actually Yahweh, surrounded with all the traditions and things that people hang on him. Or we can follow judges like Deborah, the ones with the balanced truth, who teach people to be supported, to have faith, stand on the foundation of the word, and to know where she's at in regards to work within the kingdom. And being the bond servant or the good servant, she will be elevated and have the role of the judge during the thousand years as well. So that is Deborah. Now the last judge, we're going to look at this 12, but I cut the rest, I put some of them in, but I took them out. It's going to take too long to discuss them. The next judge uh, that's applicable to us in relating to last week is Gideon. Now Gideon was one of the judges who are known as a good judge. Now, Gideon is found in chapters, or described in Judges chapters 6 and 7. And he ruled over Israel for 40 years. But prior to that, there was a seven-year period of oppression. So the seven years is what we know as the whole tribulation period of three and a half, three and a half. The first half is the birth pains, and the second half is the birth and the total is a period of seven years. And that is what the seven represent, the seven years of oppression, which is the oppression of the anti-Messiah. And he ruled, and there was peace for 40 years after him. And 40 represents the work of Messiah. So he was a, a judge that is similar to Othniel, because Othniel also had 40 connected to him. And also Deborah, she also had 40 years of peace, of rule connected to her name as well. So those three are connected through the number 40, which is the work of Messiah, or being the judges subject to the overseer, who is Yeshua, the head of the body. Now the scripture says in Judges 6 verse 11 to 14, and there came an angel of Yahweh and sat under an oak tree, which was in Orphrah and pertained into Jaish. And I wish I was asked someone to read this. <laughs> Abizite. And the son of Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon said to him, O master, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles for our fathers told us of? Saying, did not Yahweh bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And Yahweh looked upon him and said, Go in your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So this is the scripture that described the call of Gideon. And as you can see, that Gideon wasn't really confident in his abilities, or he wasn't really a man of faith. And he was doubting in his heart, because he asked the question, where's all the miracles that we saw in Egypt? Surely we need to be released in a similar way from the oppression. Now, if you think about Gideon living in this time, Gideon probably lived in this time, and Gideon proper, probably studied the book of Revelation. 
So he knew about the miracles that's described in Revelation and things going to happen. That is a picture of the miracles that happened in Egypt because the plagues that came upon Egypt were the plagues upon the gods and the miracles was to release people from the bondage of those gods. In the same way, there are gods that people are bound to and they are plagued by those gods and the judgments are upon those um, gods in order to release the people. And that is the miracle or all the miracles that will happen to release the people. So Gideon is asking the question, we need to be released from the bondage and the oppression that is currently upon us. Where is that? And Yahweh said that he has called him to release them from the hand of the Midianites. And he is referred to as a mighty warrior. Now if you look at the name of Gideon, if I can find it. just want to jump a bit. Now Gideon, his name means who bruises, who breaks, who prunes, and destroyer. So now you can understand why the angel or why Yahweh called him a mighty warrior. Because that is found within the meaning of his name or his character. So Yahweh anointed him to have those attributes. So you can see one of the attributes is to break or to destroy, to prune, and to bruise. Now when you hear the word bruise, it immediately brings a bell back to Genesis, which was the promise to the serpent. said that you will be destroyed, he will bruise your, uh, uh, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. So that's where that bruising comes into. So it's the ultimate destruction of the power of the serpent that will happen during this time as well. And as we know, the serpent will be bound after this time period, released, and then cast into the lake of fire. So that final promise will come to pass. So that is what mighty warrior represents. It's actually fighting against the principalities of evil, including Satan, as manifested through the anti-Messiah. Sorry, I'll jump back to Deborah. Now, what, what stands out when I read this verse are the two words, the two key words that we discussed last week. He threshed wheat by the wine press. Now, that's an interesting phrase. So, he's doing a wheat harvest right at the point where the wine press is. Now, threshing wheat... The wheat harvest is the time of the Great Tribulation, as symbolized by Shavuot, which is the Feast of the Harvest. And the wine press is the next phase. And that's what we looked at last week, the verse that said, He will cast you into the wine press. And that is exactly on that point where this judge is going to be most effective, as at the borderline prior to the gathering of the bride. And what is this judge going to do? Now we're going to find out um, in the symbolism of all the names. So the first name we're going to look at is Midian. Now Midian means strife and contention. Now that's basically what number three means. Contention and strife um, as inflicted by the enemy. But the Midianites has got a link to Abraham. Now Abraham's second wife Keturah... She, they had a son, uh, and their son was the father of the Midianites. So if you can look at the bigger picture and what the symbolism reflect, is that the strife and contention was amongst family members, because it was family of Abraham through, through the origin of Abraham. And Isaac was the other side of the family. But Isaac carried the birthright, and the Midianites did not. And that caused the strife. So the contention amongst the family members is basically telling us, giving us an idea what will happen during the time of the tribulation. If you think for yourself, and this is my view, there's going to be so many disappointed people because the tickets they bought for the rapture bus didn't work because the bus didn't turn up or had a flat tire or something. And they are very disappointed. 
Now there are these goody two shoes people like Deborah. So I told you so. You should have done this. You should have listened to me. Um, there's a lot of people who's going to fall away from faith and they're going to be angry and cause issues. So you have the conflict amongst the people within the body of Messiah, from each from their doctrinal standpoint, from their understanding, mixed in with a lot of disappointment and anger and a lot of fear. And that will cause the people to have all these conflicts. Now the judge, just like we saw with Sarah um, and Hagar, there was conflict within the house because of the fleshly son that was born. Now there's a lot of fleshly sons that's going to be born based on false doctrines that was believed. And there's going to be a lot of accusations. And you always need to send a judge in order to allow them to live to the end. Otherwise they might take each other out. So that is the, the, the flavor of the situation within the body of Messiah during that time. And that's one of the main reasons why Gideon was called in order to bring peace amongst Yahweh's people, as well as to bring people into the kingdom during this time. And they have to be a witness as well, not to drive people away, but to rather draw them in. Now the next verse is Judges 7 verse 1. And it says in Jeribal, Jeribal, um, that was Gideon's uh, new name, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod uh, that the army of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moria in the valley. So this was when Gideon called the people. Now, before this event happened, I must give you a bit of history why Gideon's name was changed to Jeribal. Now, when Gideon was called, the first thing he had to do was to clean the house. Now, he rose up uh, at night and he went to his uh, uh, father's house and he broke down their idols. He cut down the pillars and he used it for a burnt offering and he destroyed the altar of Baal within his father's house. And the next morning, it caused a lot of strife amongst the family. Hence the meaning of Midian. And they wanted to kill him. But his father interceded and said, If Baal was a real god, why, did Gideon was, why was Gideon able to kill him? And Jeribal means, um, let Baal defend his cause. And after that event, the people started to follow him. But before Gideon did that courageous act, he was actually very fearful in his heart. That, was, that is revealed in the meaning of the name Harod, uh, that we read now in Judges 7 verse 1. Now Harod is where they pitched the first um, time at the well of Harod. Now, Herod means terror, and that is what they experienced first. They were trying to confront the enemy, and they faced this terror, or this well that they drank from. And this terror and fear caused them to think about whether it's a good thing to, to try and uh, attack the enemy after that event of uh, destroying the idols. So, the next word that we uh, look at is, is the word uh, Moria. Now, Moria means teacher. So we see that the Midianites was in between the well of Herod and Moria, and that is basically what uh, a bad situation or the time of tribulation will invoke upon you. First of all, the first thing that will come is fear. You will dread the situation. There will be contention amongst the family. Um, you will stand your ground trying to do the right thing according to Yahweh's thing, and other people will be as upset when you do that because they don't want to stir um, the, 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 the things as it is current. But if you go to the hill of Moria, which is a high place, that depicts the teacher or Yahweh that is within that situation that will be revealed. 
So you have a choice now whether I'm going to drink from the well of terror or if I'm going to listen to the teacher or see what Yahweh is going to teach me within the situation. And that's where the separation takes place within that situation. Every time there's a, a bad situation coming your way, you know that there's a battleground for your soul. And on the one end, there's fear. And fear wants to draw you in. Because the other principle is that the thing that you fear is the thing that you worship. The thing you fear the most is the thing that you ultimately worship. So fear is a tactic of the enemy that tried to draw us away from Yahweh, from the teacher. So we need to keep our eyes on the hill of Moriah where the teacher is. And that is basically depicting the mountain with the commandments where Yahweh's standards is. So whenever we're in a situation, we need to think back of the things that Yahweh did. We need to do the right thing according to his word. And he will deliver us from that enemy. And that will steer us away from fear. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has no torment. He who fears has not been perfected in love. We love him because he, loved, he first loved us. So the opposite of fear is love. And it's your love for Yahweh and Yahweh's love for you. So first of all, you must know who you are in him. So if you are uh, relating to Deborah, she depicts the bride. And the love a groom has for his bride-to-be is a more special love than any other love. And that love should draw you through this process so you will not fear because you know the end. Yahweh has revealed the end to us and we are now studying exactly what will happen during this time. We do not have to fear. And that is basically what the book of Revelation is about. is to reveal to us the end so that we will know that Yahweh still loves us and he wants to teach us through these times that he is our father and he loves us dearly and he will come through for us and he will come and gather us at the end and destroy the enemy. So that is the truth that we need in order not to fall into the trap of drinking from the wells of terror. And that is basically what Gideon had to face as well. He had to overcome his fear, his fear for his family, do the right thing, even though he knew that the whole town and all his family members and even his father will be against him. But once he did that, Yahweh came up for him and he overcame and he became a righteous judge from that day forward. So Yahweh expects us to do exactly the same as what Gideon did. From his name, as I said, it means to break, uh, to prune and to destroy. So if you follow a judge like Gideon, there's a lot of things that you need to get rid of. A lot of things that you need to unlearn or to prune from your life. And it's in relation to the idols that we learned from the previous judge, the fat king that we used to serve, which is false doctrines and religions and man-made traditions that is hung onto the image of what Yahweh is actually about. So we need to prune all of those things, and that is basically what it means to follow a judge like Gideon. And that will stir up a lot of strife amongst your spiritual family, as well as your natural family. There's a lot of people who, who bear witness regarding that. Once they come to faith, your family is on your case. They don't understand why you do these funny things. And they think you've gone crazy. And they persecute you, in a sense. But what does it mean to be persecuted for the sake of the name of Yahweh? Second uh, Timothy 3 verse 12 says... And uh, yeah, all uh, and all who desire to live goodly, godly in Messiah Yeshua will be persecuted. And John fifteen twenty verse twenty one says, "Remember the the word that I say to you: the servant is not greater than his master. And if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they 
have kept my saying, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you for you uh, for my name's sake, because they do not know whom him who sent me. So it's all about the sake of the name of Yahweh or the name of Yeshua. So standing on his name or bearing his name is basically what caused the persecution. Now if we take a step forward into the book of Revelation, we read about the name of Yahweh on the foreheads of people. That's Revelation 14 verse 1. And that relates to the 144,000 who had the name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So for the sake of the name, there will be persecution of the saints, even during the time of the tribulation. And I believe this 144,000 depicts the, the judges like Gideon, who will live and rule during the time of the great tribulation. And they will have the name of Yahweh on their foreheads. So what does that mean? Will it be a physical name? Will you see it? Can be. But I think there's a, a more spiritual truth behind that. Because your name is your character. And if you have the name or the character of Yahweh on your forehead, the forehead points to the area of your brain where you make decisions. So if you make a decision based on the character of Yahweh, it means that your actions will be in line with his character as well. So bearing his name on your forehead means that I walk in his character, I make decisions according to his word the same way you would have done it. And that is what made Gideon or those leaders great judges during that time. And they needed to be strong because there's a lot of contention. The second task of Gideon, he had to gather the people and call the father. That's found in Judges 6, verse 34 to 35. And it said, But the Spirit of Yahweh came to Gideon, and he blew the ram's horn, and he called the Abizites after him. And he sent messages throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered after him. And he sent messages to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. So the Spirit of Yahweh came upon Gideon, and he blew the shofar. Now the word spirit is the word ruach, and the word blue is the word taka. Oh, taka, I don't have that in a notes. So it's tet, kof, iron. Taka. And that means to blow. And that's what you do with shofar. Now what's interesting about the word taka, it means to blow, to thrust, but it also means to pitch a tent. And if you think about pitching a tent, it immediately links to a feast called Sukkot, where you pitch a sukkah, or set up a tent. And Sukkot is associated with the kingdom after the thousand years. And it's associated with the presence of Yahweh, and that's what the tabernacle was, is to house the presence of Yahweh within the tent they pitched. So if you blow the shofar, Yahweh's presence will come among you. It's similar to what Psalm 22 verse 3 says, that he inhabits our praises. It's a similar concept. So when you blow the shofar, you're actually calling the Father, and he come and he dwell and pitch his tent with us, and his presence is with us. And that's confirmed with the word of Bizarites, that means help of the Father. So you're actually calling the Father to come and help you, and you come to pitch his tent among his people, just like he had the tabernacle amongst the, the children of Israel, and they were a very powerful nation because of the presence. The word ram's horn in this verse is the word shofar, and the word shofar means beauty. So blowing the shofar is a sign of becoming like Deborah, to beautify yourself, to become the bride. So that's number one. The other function or meaning of the shofar is to gather the people. And that's exactly what this verse says, that the people came together. 
Now they came together in unity for a purpose. And that's the next meaning of blowing the shofar, is to assemble the people for a time of war. Now the time of war is during the time of Gideon. Now there's more information regarding Gideon, how he defeated the enemy with a handful of people, only 300 men. And blowing the shofar caused confusion, and they start to kill one another because of that. And Yahweh stepped up mightily, being a great help amongst them, having their presence there. So the next meeting of blowing the shofar um, uh, means to uh, assemble the people and gather them to become a unity within the body of Messiah. And that's exactly what the purpose of Gideon is because of all the conflict and all the infighting in the beginning. You need to lay the foundation, blow the shofar, start to establish the presence and to bring unity amongst the people. And unity mean, means that they need to have the same understanding regarding the word, regarding the character of Yahweh, regarding the time frame they're in, regarding where they need to be, what they need to do during this time period and how they need to interact with other people of the nations in order to help them in. In, in other words, to fully function as the body of Messiah within that situation. So Gideon is similar to the Shafat, which is the mouthpiece, the judge, who will speak and will rule, submitting to Shoter, which is Messiah, representing the fullness of the body once they come into unity. And the shofar is one of those interest, instruments that does that. And the final meaning of blowing the shofar is to cause confusion within the spiritual. So we don't really understand how powerful it is to blow the shofar. So the most significant, two most significant things is that you cause confusion in the spiritual realm within the camps of the enemy. And you're calling the presence of the Father and the help of the Father when you do that. That is why Yahweh asks us or commands us to blow the shofar on every new moon, on the appointed times, and the feast days. So we need to call the people to assemble together. And those times is when the bride come together in unity to beautify herself and get herself ready for the Messiah who is coming. Psalm 81 verse 3 says, Blow the ram's horn in the new moon in the time appointed on your solemn feast day. Nehemiah 4 verse 20 says, In whatever place you hear the sound of the ram's horn or the shofar, join us there, our Elohim fights for us. And that is exactly what that means. Now we're heading up towards the next festival, the next Moedim, which is the Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Now the Feast of Trumpets is the feast that will be fulfilled more or less around there, close to the end of the time of the Great Tribulation. And that goes hand in hand with the judgments that are linked to the seven trumpets of which there will be a last trumpet, which are part of the judgments that will come upon the enemy during that time. So the trumpet is a very instrumental instrument that form part of the destruction of the bondage that the enemy has on the people. So when the people cry out, that word cry out, Yom Teruah also means the day of shouting. It can also depict the people crying out. And the judge that will be there, we need to listen to those people, that those anointed people who will lead us through that time period. And then there will be repentance. And as there is repentance, unity will come, and then we'll serve Yahweh again. And as soon as we reach that point, then Yeshua will come and gather his bride. So that will be the call of Messiah to come and gather us. And that can only happen once we complete the full cycle. And as I said, the cycle begins as we slide into tribulation through our sin and rebellion of the nation that is currently happening. So we're calling down the judgment of Yahweh upon ourselves by allowing these things. So I think tonight we need to pray against it. or well, not really against it. It's going to happen anyway. We need to pray for the people who are entrapped with the mindset 
that want to do sinful things because they rebel against Yahweh's word and Yahweh's truth. So that basically concludes our teaching for tonight. Um, I haven't spoken about or haven't uh, revealed any of the other judges. All I can say is that Samson was the last judge and the meanings of his name and the symbolism around him placed him during the thousand year period. So he was a judge ruling there. So Samson was here. What? No, Samson. Yeah. Why you bit the bullet? Yeah, Samson. Appointed by men, some appointed themselves, and that just show the chaos of or the state of the body of Messiah during that time. And um, but we don't have enough time to go through all of that. So that concludes our study. Um, if there's any questions or comments, you're welcome, and we can uh, discuss that. You want to use the microphone, please? Otherwise, people won't. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about. Uh, I'm switch it on. It is on. Isn't it on? Okay. Is my voice too low that it's not on? It doesn't sound on. <laughs> uh, um, you're talking about there um, during the, the, uh, the, the crushing time, uh, the uh, point, point number three there, I think it is, or point number four, crying out to uh, that many of the, many of the faith, um, uh, for example, after the rapture it doesn't happen, many people fall away. I had an impression several days ago that uh, non-religious people or non-spiritual people who like to do, who like to live in a way incompatible with the law of love, or Christians or religious people or spiritual people who fall away and then attack uh, Christians or spiritual people, I had an impression that it's similar to the tall poppy syndrome, where they and this goes back to Lucifer as well, which caused him to rebel, is the jealousy that they see in us, <clears throat> us uh, living in harmony with God's law, and they, that, turns them, that turns their hatred uh, uh, against us because they see that we have achieved what they were not able to achieve. And so they fall, and that turns their falling away into hatred against people who are doing what they wanted to do, but they gave up and were not able to do it. Yeah, nobody... ...was the persecution and the conflict. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Um, on page 9, it talks about the 144,000. Who are they? So the 144,000... The... Leaving Egypt and the leaving of Babylon is the same pattern. The one is the exodus, the other is the greater exodus. Because you have to leave a system. And it's a system of bondage. So Moses and Aaron, and later on the 70 elders, were the leaders who led the people, as they came out of sin and bondage, through the time period until they reached the promised land. In the same way, the 144,000 are the leaders or the judges or those two entities, as we saw. But in, in the 144,000 
is about. They are the leaders. And if you compare that directly with what we overlaid with the end time, the 144 are like Gideon. So he is the one who prunes. He's the one who destroy all the enemy and all the symbolism and all the things that relates to the people's idol worship that caused them to slip into this phase anyway. So he allows leaders like Gideon and like the 144,000 to lead his people through this process of separation. As I said last week, Every time there's a harvest, there's a separation. So the wheat harvest has a separation where the bride will be separated from the people living on the earth and the people who are alive during the earth will consist of religious people who will be... they cling to and it will also be people who haven't heard anything um, they were born into a nation that didn't really understand the, the ways of Yahweh or they were just good people and they will go through this process um, where there will be another separation and Deborah will come and be appointed and last week we saw the royal priesthood authority or royal Deborah, and uh, she sat under the palm tree, and she judged the people as they come and gave them counsel according to the word of Yahweh. What I didn't mention is Deborah's name. Her name means, um, or her name comes from the root word, Dabba. Basically, what she will do when she come and judge the people for a thousand years to teach and to rule and to present the word to them over that time period. No worries. So the most important Now, if you think about prophecy of how prophecy is connected to a time, it can be like a, a clock with two or three arms that need to align to certain numbers to, to tell a certain time. Now, if you read Daniel... Onwards, there's a count, which is another time period. And that's a specific way prophecy can point to a time, and that time has got a theme and a topic that will happen. Now, the 1260 days is the time period of three and a half years of the reign of the anti Messiah, where people will be oppressed. It's also the They will go through the cycle until they come back to him. The other way prophecy is linked to time is through minor prophecies that give you a season that point out that the real... ...happen in history that will tell you we are now the last generation. But that gives you a broad time frame of where we are in. It's not a specific time like a clock. But we need 
the clock correctly. Now those who, has learned, those who have learned to read the clock but do not do that, the prophecy doesn't mean anything to them. And that's basically... Because that's one of the things that disciples wanted to know. When is the time of your coming? They wanted to know that. It was very important to them. And it should also be a question we need to ask. Yahweh. Season. And then we need to look for prophecy to know the exact point. But that won't be the exact time. And then you need to observe the time frame. And within the time... It's happening to say that the Word of God is true... Because this is prophesied, that's prophesied, that's prophesied. It lines up with the newspaper, it's happening, and then people can come to faith. Yes? Um, you're talking about the number 40 having a meaning of a work of the Messiah, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, etc. Uh, the number 40 appears many times throughout Scripture, but he only lived to be 33 and a half years. How does, the, how does his, uh, well, tip, uh, strictly speaking, his, his ministry was... Same question you can ask, why is he the lamb, why is he the lion, why is he the highest priest, why is he the sacrifice, why is he the son of God, why is he the king, why is he the groom? It's the same answer. It's not one or the other, it's both. The num- The 33 is linked to the covenant. Number 3 and number 30 has the same meaning, and it means covenant. And I think we look at the gematria of 3 last week as well. I can't remember what it meant. It has to do with... And it adds on information regarding Yeshua. So, if he... If his man ministry as well. That's right, that's another symbolism that's connected to him. Yeah. So he sets the example and we need to walk in it. So Ford is connected to us as well as his disciples. Yeah. Do you think there's a connection between 33 um, and 33 degrees of uh, mason- Freemasonry? Absolutely. Yeah, so the Freemasons basically copy.
to Freemasonry. It means covenant, but it's meaning a covenant with the wrong Messiah in their case. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But they. So what are we to do, for example, with our current situation, with this marriage thing? What should be practical? Can he, can he take it away? We must think about the context of Sodom and Gomorrah. What was Abraham's response and what was Yahweh? Must pray for the people who embrace evil because they rebel against Yahweh's word, which is totally contradictory to what he specified regarding marriage. So when people Now, I'm not going to draw it on the board. I can't remember it fully. The, the word for uh, man and wife is ish and isha. Now, they share... only work between people who are different that's connected with Yahweh. If you take Yahweh out, all that is left is Ish. That means fire. That will burn you. And that fire actually taking Yahweh out of his creation. You cause an imbalance and now there needs to be energy added to the imbalance to consume or balance. But if you involve Yahweh's things, our creation includes the spiritual as well. So if you bring an imbalance And there will be energy coming down, which is the ish or the fire, that need to set back the imbalance and bring order. Bring the imbalance in, and that triggers the fire that need to consume the imbalance so the balance can come back. So we invoke judgment upon ourselves. Take away that law, everything will collapse. It needs to be there to sustain everything. So we are bound to the boundaries and the And if there's a majority of people believing the same, the same will happen as with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the fire will come down to consume the imbalance to bring order. Judgment upon us, which includes me, 
because I'm part of this nation. So I will suffer with them. But they are evil, not me. But unfortunately, mercy and grace for them, and also that Yahweh can change their hearts so that we will not suffer with them. But unfortunately, the This is something which is rather interesting because this marriage debate has been around for a very long time and I've certainly had a few discussions through the internet about it. And you're the entire species turn homosexual, the species would die out in, in one generation, hypothetically. Yes. And it's just, um, that's just the... ...that sex does. And then Paul talks about in Romans that when man has sex with another man, they will get their due reward. Mm. Um, there's a lot. And in man's image, we're the only species that can actually do that. Because we've got the total free choice. Our liberty. When we found life on other planets. This one scientist was saying because probably the society destroyed itself before it had the capabilities. And they say this is probably the, what mankind will end up doing. Yeah. And how, how it reflects in the Bible. I just want to read this verse again. He has given you. And they shall judge the people fairly. Follow justice and justice. Uh, preserving life, you need justice. Without justice, you will destroy yourself. Yeah, so the... Out of the Salvation Army's in the Red Shoe Appeal. <laughs> Maybe somebody called Rothschild. 
Yeah. Um, can I also add to the previous point there? talking about freedom as well, it's not so much freedom that they're seeking, it's unbridled freedom, unrestricted freedom. And everyone's being conned with the same sex stuff. ...to the next step, which is legalising pedophilia, which is what it's all about. Once you once you legalise, it's already happened. Sexuals are saying we can't help it. We're born that way. Pedophiles are saying we can't help it. We're born that way, and it's already they're already talking about it in parliaments around. Legalised pedophilia, guaranteed. Yeah, it's a snowball effect, yeah. yeah.